by asking questions about the question. And uh, the main question that we are looking at this week is the question, what is our only hope in life and death? And the answer is that we are not our own, but belong, body and soul, both in life and death, to God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's the answer. What is our only hope in life and death? That we are not our own but belong to God is the short answer for that. Uh, so I want to ask questions about the question, okay? Because as we disciple others, uh, part of that is uh, simply that, uh, that that raises more and more questions. Are you going to have to stand up and do that? No. You, you can sit it down. It's not good. I don't it's, want you to stand there all the time. It's going to be at the waist. It's going to what? Be at your waist. At my waist? Yes. <laughs> There. What if we did that? I tried. It doesn't have to get all of me. That's all right. I'm prepared. I'm prepared. So what you if I sit? What if I sit up? Yeah, you sit down. Do whatever you need to, do, brother. Okay. We're working out the case. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons 
and daughters, multiply there, do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie, and they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I, and here's the one that's often taken out of context. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you to exile. Now, a few things to note. Look at that first angle, expectations of a future. What does God give them? He gives them expectations. They have certain expectations that they believe are going to be played out in the future. Look at verse 10. Okay, look back at verse 10. Uh, 10 and 11 says, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, I will fulfill to you my promise, and bring you back to this place. But listen to this promise, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Those concepts of future and hope go intrinsically together. It's kind of like Proverbs 23, 18 says, Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. So this concept of the future plays heavily into this idea of hope. But look at that second angle we talked about, assurance of that future, uh, of that future being realized. This is not just a vision. This is not just wishful thinking on their part. They're not hoping against hope without any basis for fulfillment, but they're basing their hope on God's faithfulness. Why should they believe that God's going to do what he says he's going to do? They believe that because he's done what he said he was going to do in the past. They can look at the history of God's faithfulness. So if you ask somebody, uh, you hire somebody to come and mow your lawn, and then they never show up, and then you hire them again, and then they never show up again, guess what? You don't have a lot of hope in them because of what happened in the past, but if you've got somebody and every week they're there or every other week they're there right when they say they're going to be there and they do a great job, then guess what? You've got hope next week that they're going to show up and they're going to do their job. Why? Because of their faithfulness in the past. We have faith in those who are faithful. They have hope in the one who has been faithful to them, and so they have this assurance of that future being realized. So right now I don't have a whole lot of hope in the long board. Anyway, um, <laughs> number angle number three. I'm sure they'll come to our event. Uh, number angle number three. Patient contentment in waiting. Patient contentment in waiting. Notice that God says to them, "Build houses, live in them, get married, give your sons and your daughters in marriage." Seek the welfare of the city. Why is he telling them to do all these things in the present? Because they've got hope for the future. Having a hope means that you can wait patiently in the future because of what you know is awaiting you. And so they are called to live in light of the future. Uh, they go on living life in exile knowing that an exodus is coming. That's what gives them inner peace. They know they're not going to be there forever. They know it's not permanent, okay? Um, angle, and, and by the way, they know it's not permanent. It's still going to be 70 years. Okay? For some of us here tonight, that is forever. But not for the community as a whole. Imagine if this were written to the church. This is how this passage is taken out of context. We take that, we put it on our coffee mug, and we claim that verse as our individual verse. I've got a future, and I've got a hope. Most of these folks are going to die in exile. But they know that God is faithful to his people and his promise, and he's going to take his chosen people back and restore them. And that was why they trusted in God.
We've got a very individualistic mindset today where it's about me, it's about what I'm going to get. They didn't have necessarily that same concept, that same mindset back then. Um, angle number four, uh, the desirability of the coming benefits. Notice verses 12 through 14. You will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you in exile. Uh, the, the reward makes the difference in many respects. God is their portion ultimately. He's going to, in an earthly sense, restore their fortunes restore their nation, bring healing. And so there, this hope, this biblical hope, is based on a certain benefit that they are going, that God's going to bless them with in the future, okay? So benefit matters when you're in exile, okay? Um, ladies, just imagine if you had to go through uh, the pain of labor knowing that at the end you just got a box of chocolates. <laughs> Probably not. I mean, some of us made a lot of chocolate, but probably not enough of motivation. I'm just based on the secondhand information. I don't know. Probably not enough. But why do you do that? Because why you want children? You love children, and that is the reward. And so, whatever suffering and pain a person goes through, they say the reward is worth it. And the same is. Uh, the same concept is found in the Bible, the desirability of coming benefits. Uh, finally, angle number five again, trust in the promises of God. Look at verse uh, 10 again, trust in the promises of God. He is promising them that after 70 years, he restores their fortunes in a sense. Uh, we would not have hope had God not revealed himself and made these promises. So the whole reason why he could have not spoken to them through the prophet, the whole reason that they have hope at all is because God has spoken to them and given them a promise. And that is the basis of them having hope at all is the revelation of God. Now, let's flip this back and let's take this concept to the New Testament. Because all that was just, that's just the Old Testament. The Bible says that that's a shadow of what's yet to come. So as excited as they might have been about some of the promises of God and, and as thick and strong and powerful as their hope might have been in God, guess what? Ours is taken to a radically different level in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's given greater clarity. Let's look at those angles again from a New Testament perspective. Ex uh, angle number one, expectation of a future um, all you have to do is look at the afterlife. You know, the interesting thing is this concept of the afterlife, very murky in the Old Testament. So don't talk a lot about afterlife in the Old Testament. It's interesting, I was listening to Ben Shapiro, and uh, he's a practicing Jew, and he's explaining why he didn't believe in Jesus, so he said a bunch of other stuff. But one thing he, he brought out, even in his uh, little talk, is that they didn't really have that concept fully developed in the Old Testament. It's the New Testament that takes that and brings it to an entirely different level of what the afterlife will look like. Turn over with me just briefly to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <coughs>
So when we die, we go to be with God. We are with God. Verse 15. For this we declare to you by word from the Lord that we who are alive and are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of the archangel with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is speaking of this time where we are going to go and be with God. We will always, that's what he says, we will always be with the Lord. Okay? To be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. So there's this expectation of the future. Now, here's second angle. What assurance do we have that that future is going to be a reality? What assurance do we have that that future is going to be realized? And here it is. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason that that gives us the assurance is because what 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about, what 1 Thessalonians 4 is talking about, is this concept of resurrection. That one day, just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we will be raised up from the dead in glorified form. Let me just read to you briefly from 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, he says... In uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 53, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory of death. Where is your victory of death? Where is your sting? It's this concept of death itself being defeated. We are given immortality. And if you start at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, all of this is based on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have assurance of this future. Now, here's, here's another wonderful reality. Even as we're resurrected, we know from Hebrews 11 and so on that we have something awaiting us that's incomparable to anything we are going through in this life. It says that Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was before him. Okay, and that brings us to our third angle again. Patient contentment and waiting. Paul said, I've learned to be content in any and every situation. Philippians chapter 4. I've learned to be content in any and every situation. Why? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He could go through the suffering because why? He knew ultimately what awaited him. Uh, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, as I've said many times before, one of my favorite passages, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day, for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, the things that are unseen are so how do we make it through this light momentary affliction without losing heart? How do we not lose heart? The opposite of that would be how do we have hope? And we have hope. Why? Because of the incomparable weight of glory that awaits us. So that informs and shapes the way that we live in the present so that we can be patient and content in waiting. This concept of waiting has a lot to do with uh, the idea of hope in the Bible. Angle number four, the desirability of the benefits to come. Just, I mean, literally read Revelation, but especially Revelation 21 and 22. What are the benefits awaiting us? Again, we go back to this picture uh, given to us in Revelation chapter 22. I just want to read a few verses for you from there. It says in Revelation 21 that God makes all things new. In Revelation 22, verse 1, it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of the life, bright as crystals, bright as crystals flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the trees of the tree were the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any at first, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and 
night will be no more. They will need no light of a lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Just reading it gives you hope. I mean, just imagining that inspires you. Okay, I, if, if that's what's awaiting me, I think I can make it in the here and now. Why? Because of the benefits to come. The benefits to come. And then finally, I think all of this uh, goes along with uh, trusting in the promises of God. This is a promise. This is presented to us as a promise and reasonable to believe it because of what we find in the person and work of Jesus. So what is hope? That is the rich, full picture of what hope is. Now I just want to ask you know, one or two other questions tonight, and they'll go a little bit quicker than that one. Turn over with me uh, to Revelation, uh, excuse me, Romans chapter 14. Romans. Uh, chapter 14. If uh, you're going through this with your family, this is uh, where the, the main passage is found. And here's the second question I want to ask tonight. How is belonging to God and not being our own, our only hope? Remember the question, what is our only hope in life and death? And that is that we are not our own, but belong body and soul, both in life and death, to God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's read this main passage that our families are going over this week. From Romans chapter 14, starting at verse 7 and going to 12. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother, or why do you despise your brother? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Here's the reality. We are what we would call contingent beings. That, that means that our life and our existence is ultimately not in our power and control. Okay, so... Nobody gets to say, you know what, on this date, 30 years from now, that's when uh, I'm going to breathe my last breath. God gives, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. He has the power of life and death in his hands. This is not something that we are sovereign over. We don't have ultimate sovereignty over our present or our future. And if we belong to ourselves rather than God, that means that we don't really have a whole lot of hope. Listen to uh, how this relates to our discussion of apology. We said that if God does not exist, life would not have ultimate meaning, purpose, or value. I want you to think about that in relation to what we've heard. On atheism, there's no future for us. There's no purpose for our present suffering. No vindication of good or judgment of evil. And no promise of immortality. You see how this all relates to our question, what is our only hope? Our only hope is that we are not our own, but that we do belong to God because we are our own. If naturalism is true, we don't have hope. We can't control the present, we can't control the future, and we certainly can't control after we die. We have control of nothing, physical matters, all there is, and to dust will return, our faith will be the same as the faith of a beast. Um, however, if we belong to God, who is all-powerful, absolutely sovereign and loving, the creator of the universe, we have incredible hope for the reasons that we just went over. Notice what Paul says here. He says, we are the Lord's. We are the Lord's. He affirms that neither life nor death can affect our union with Christ. As he says in Romans chapter 8, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Not in life, not in death. If we belong to God, we are His. As John 17 says, nothing can snatch us out of our Father's hand. Okay, We are firmly in His grasp, and we are protected by Him. Listen to these words from John Calvin. He says, If we then are not our own but the Lord's, it is clear what error we must flee, and whither we must direct all the acts of our life. We are not our own. Let not our reason nor our will therefore sway our plans and deeds. We are not our own. Let us therefore not set it out as our goal to seek what is expedient for us. We are not our own. Insofar as we can, let us forget ourselves and all that is ours. Conversely, we are God's. Let us therefore live 
for him and died for him. We are gods. Let his wisdom and will therefore rule all our actions. We are gods. Let all the parts of our life accordingly strive toward him as our only lawful goal. Oh, how much has the man profited who, having been taught that he is not his own, has taken away dominion and rule from his own reason, that he may yield it to God. For as consulting our self-interest is a pestilence that most effectively leads us to our destruction, so the sole haven of salvation is to be wise in nothing and to will nothing through ourselves, but to follow the leading of the Lord alone. Now I just want you to notice how much richer... This answer is than the answer of the world. And let me just uh, meddle a little bit tonight, okay? So uh, right now, of course, uh, the, uh, there's controversy about Nike's new ad, okay? Uh, and, uh, you know, the guy from Colin Kaepernick is kind of their, their face right now. But I want you to listen to the mod, their motto right now. I want you to listen to this motto and see how it compares to what we're talking about tonight. And this is important because this whole, the whole reason we're doing this kind of setup tonight for our kids, for in here, is because we want to shape our worldview in terms of a Christian theology, a Godward theology, okay? And that, that has a major uh, impact on how you filter things in and how you understand the world, okay? So uh, the motto is believe in something. Uh, even if you have to sacrifice everything. Believe in something, even if you have to sacrifice everything. Now, here's the dangerous implication of that. Believe in whatever you want. Just believe in something. Whatever you subjectively choose to believe in, believe in that. Go that direction, even if you have to sacrifice everything for it. That's like saying, fire this weapon and... Empty out all the rounds if you have to. Okay? That, that's just a neutral state. That doesn't mean anything because people who fly planes into buildings believe in something and they sacrifice everything for it. It doesn't mean anything. It's a dangerous statement. That's a subjective understanding of the world that you are the center, you are your own captain, and you choose whatever it is you want to invest your life in. You do that, and kudos to you. This is different. This is saying there is an objective reality out there that we are not our own. We belong to God. And that is our only hope in life and in death is that we belong to God. Listen to this poem by, uh, called Invictus by William Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I think whatever God's may be. For my unconquerable soul, my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged the punishments, the scroll. I am the master of my fate, I am the captain. Of my soul. This is a different way of thinking than what we've talked about tonight. Our hope is not in human ingenuity. It's not in human reason. It's not in human knowledge. Our hope is in God. Our hope is in the fact that we are not our own, but that we belong to God. And if you just kind of take away everything else and just think on this, you'll realize, yeah, if I've got any hope at all in this life, it is that I do belong to God, and I'm not my own, okay? All right, so uh, tonight, just two questions about the question, um, but I always want to open it up uh, towards the end for any of you who have questions. Maybe as you decide with your kids, they've asked certain questions, uh, you know, you try to doubt this uh, this question, what is our only hope in life and death? And they said, Dad, who did Cain marry? You know, and, and uh, so uh, maybe the questions weren't that far filled, but maybe you have questions or your kids have questions. We'll have time every Wednesday night for you to ask whatever questions you have about this or make any comments. So, any
Any questions or comments tonight?